tonight's uh, main presentation, uh, something we're going to get to in just a minute, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce to you a gentleman named Rod Canyon, um, who's the president of Compaq Computer Corporation. Uh, when I found out that Rod was coming up tonight to talk to BCS about the Compaq, I, I volunteered to uh, come up to the front. We're, we're in a way sort of family, which is one of my reasons for being here in the sense that we uh, share uh, some of the same investors and, and, and board members, so anything that I might say about Compaq is, is probably favorably biased, but I will say that it is the personal computer which I use in my office uh, to find out why and to find out what's going on with Compaq. Uh, I'd like to bring Rod up here and tell you about it, and we'll show it to you. It's the first time the Compaq has been on the East Coast. Uh, Rod, come on up. I'd like to thank uh, Mitch for that uh, uh, welcome. I'd also like to thank Jonathan and all of you for having me here tonight. Um, the prestige and influence of the Boston Computer Society is well known throughout the land, even as far away as Houston and uh, the rest of what is now known as Silicon Prairie. Uh, so it, it really is an honor to be asked to speak to this justifiably famous organization. But it's also a little disconcerting to me personally. Uh, my partners and I at Compaq like to consider ourselves reasonably young entrepreneurs. Uh, and we are in our part of the country where the electronics industry is dominated by the more senior types at Texas Instruments, uh, DataPoint, and uh, EDS. Then I come to Boston and meet the Dan Bricklands and the Mitch Kapoor's and other uh, industry leaders of that young generation, and as ego deflating as that is, they commence to tell me that they are the old men of the local computer scene and they're looking over their shoulders at Jonathan Ruttenberg and his crowd that are really coming up fast. All I can tell you is that while I'm truly honored to be here, I will return to Houston much more humble than uh, when I came. Uh, I'd like to uh, turn on the first slide, I guess, and. We can bring the lights down. I would like to cover three areas this evening. First, I'll tell you about the Compact Portable Computer. Then I'll briefly cover who Compact Computer Corporation is and how we got here. Finally, I have a few points to make about the personal computer market. Then I'll be happy to answer any questions and give you a personal demonstration of the Compact if you have time. The idea for the compact portable computer came from an analysis of the needs in the personal computer market which weren't being served. It seems that the need for portability was not understood very well at that time by most market observers. The highly successful Osborne portable computer was not selling so much because it was portable as it was because of its low price. This situation turned out to be a blessing for compact because it obscured the fact that portability really was and is an important need. There was one place that the need for portability was well understood. A business person who had been using a personal computer at their office for a few months could tell you that every now and then they really needed to take their computer home. To most, the personal computer was a tool that helped them in decision making. And a lot of important decisions are made in the quiet atmosphere of a home, or in some cases, a hotel room on the road. In one sense, a cruel trick had been played on them. They had been exposed to a fantastic new tool to help them make decisions, but it wasn't available to them at the times when they really needed it. Further inspection of this situation reveals another important factor. While portability is important, the product's usefulness as a personal computer must not be compromised in order to achieve it. So the real need we discovered was for a fully functional personal computer which is suitable for use in an office all day long, but which is packaged in a portable enclosure that may be easily transported home or to any other destination. Next slide, please. A 
As I describe the compact for you, I'll do so in the context of what I believe are the primary requirements for a personal computer to be useful in a business environment. And it's important to remember throughout my comments this evening that I'm talking about that combination, a personal computer as opposed to a business system or a business computer, but a personal computer that's used in a business environment. These requirements are listed here. First, it must be a full function personal computer in a portable enclosure. Secondly, the most important and the most useful software must be readily available for it. Third, it must be compatible with other personal computers already being used in companies. And fourth, the product must be capable of expanding to take advantage of important new capabilities which become available in the market. Next slide, please. First, I'll address full function personal computers in a portable enclosure. There's really two parts to this, full functionality and portability. First, I'll look at portability. Next slide, please. This is the compact in its carrying state, somewhat distorted due to the angle of the uh, projector, but uh, you can see it up close and get full view of it. It's, it is transportable, it's fully self-contained, can be carried by a single handle. Uh, it's 28 pounds in its standard configuration, so it's uh, uh, certainly not uh, at the low end of the portable spectrum. The important thing though, it is, it is transportable. And a very important characteristic is that it is easy to get ready to, to use when you arrive at a location, and it's also easy to take from a state of uh, operation and get it ready for carrying with you. And, uh, and you'll see some of the characteristics as I go through and then later on we'll, we'll go into them in more detail. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, sort of take you through uh, uh, the opening of the compact. If we were to have arrived at a location, uh, sit it on a table looking something like this. Next slide, please. Turning it around, which is really the bottom of the compact, you see there's two feet that uh, adjust the uh, viewing angle of the uh, display. They're shown here in the uh, uh, closed state. And if you go to the next slide, you can see uh, after they're opened. And then the next slide shows how uh, it can be laid over uh, without picking it up and setting it. You just simply take the handle, leaning it directly over. Uh, and then it's, it's uh, ready for you to go on to the next step, uh, which the next slide shows. Looking at it from the front view, this is the keyboard mounted into the front. Uh, the two uh, indentions at the bottom are the feet. Go to the next slide, you can see that they normally will be open before you remove the keyboard. And then the two indentions just above that are actually the latches, which uh, are easily removed. The keyboard is lifted out, and uh, then it looks like the next slide. So this is the... Uh, uh, compact after it is now open and ready to uh, to use. You'll notice the uh, coiled card, if you can see it over here on the left, it comes uh, attached, it goes into a, a hole in the front so that it can easily be pulled out, set in your lap. It's a full six foot coil card and then when you get ready to go it coils back up inside the machine. You don't have to fool with uh, laying the cable and trying to get it straight. Okay, the next slide please. Uh, we're not quite complete yet because uh, it needs to be powered. On the left side of the unit, as you're facing it, there's a, uh, a door which slides open easily to reveal the power compartment. Uh, and here is room for power card storage, power switch, uh, power card is removed, plugged in, and then uh, there's also the air exit for the fan. Normally at this stage you're ready to go if you're uh, doing a spreadsheet. Uh, or possibly uh, using a word processing program. But if you, if you need to connect a peripheral, the other side, if you go to the next slide, there's a, a similar door which opens up to uh, show the uh, I.O. compartment. Here are uh, uh, connectors for the parallel printer interface, which is standard. In the second slot from the front of the machine, there, uh, which is the display board, there are actually three uh, different connectors for hooking up uh, different uh, external displays. There's one for RGB monitor, one for a uh, composite video, 
and there's also a uh, right at the top a uh, connection to hook in an RF modulator if you're going to use it with a home TV. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this should be uh, fairly uh, recognizable. This is the, even though you can't read from that distance the uh, characters, this is the Telltale VisiCalc screen. Uh, it should look very much like uh, the IBM personal computer to those of you who are familiar with it. Um, there are one or two mini floppy drives there on the front. Keyboard, of course, uh, is identical in layout to the IBM personal computer, including uh, keys which are considered to be out of place. Uh, we would love to have fixed them, and I think uh, some, some other uh, manufacturers coming down the road have, quote, fixed them. But the uh, problem really gets in to a uh, level of compatibility, and, and it ties into uh, reference manuals or training manuals for software. Well, it seems like a minor problem to you who are familiar with it becomes a very major issue when you're trying to find F10 and it's not over on the left side of the keyboard where the manual says it is. Seems minor. Compatibility is, a, is an important aspect. Uh, the display itself in layout is also identical. It's a full 80-character uh, display, 25 lines. Uh, the uh, character font uh, is the same high resolution font that IBM originally uh, introduced, at least to the personal computer segment of the market. Uh, we actually put quite a bit of effort in on making the screen readable. It's a nine inch display, uh, but by uh, going to the higher resolution characters and actually putting quite a bit of time into to making the, the display itself very stable and uh, completely flicker free, uh, it is highly readable, can be used all day long without any uh, uh, eye strain. Next slide, please. And while uh, readable characters are very important, <clears throat> uh, graphics, I think, um, at least I know some of the people in this room will agree with me, is uh, really becoming uh, increasingly important. Even though it has been important in the past with programs such as uh, Visiplot, uh, the, the next day of uh, productivity programs which allow you to use a spreadsheet and then immediately display in a graphic form your data uh, will really cause the users, I believe, to demand graphics capability on the same screen with their uh, uh, text characters. What you see here is a uh, fully compatible graphic screen. Uh, it is fully compatible with the IBM Color Graphics adapter including the color capability, which you can get if you uh, connect an external color monitor. But for uh, running programs that do use color, uh, we've mapped the 16 colors that the IBM has to uh, 16 different shades of green. And so that uh, for running game programs or actually uh, graphic programs, uh, 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 graphs that show uh, different pieces in different uh, colors will also show up intelligibly on the compact. I guess I should point out that uh, to achieve the same level of readability of text and uh, full graphics capability requires two monitors and two controller boards on the IBM personal computer. So we've taken the display capability one step further by combining the best of both of their options into one built-in display. Okay, so in summary, uh, the compact in its standard configuration lists for $29.95 comes with the complete display capability seen here, the high resolution text and graphics, professional 83 key keyboard, a single 320 k byte mini floppy disk drive, 128 k bytes of RAM, parallel printer port, output for the three external displays. <clears throat> and for all that, if you bought a comparably equipped IBM with only one monitor, your choice of either monochrome or graphics, still runs about $600 less than the IBM PC. But you know, I've really only addressed one of the four requirements. Next slide, please. Second requirement is software availability. There's nothing I can think of that's more useless than a shiny new computer that doesn't have the software you need to solve your particular problem. 
Fortunately for us, the largest base of useful business software is available for the compact. That's because when it came time to select the software architecture of the compact, we decided to make it compatible with the IBM personal computer. Compatibility is basically a simple concept. If you keep in mind that the primary purpose of software compatibility is to create software availability. This leads us to a very simple definition of software compatibility. Next slide, please. Simply to be able to run all the important software packages directly off the shelf without modification. Important programs like, for example, VisiCalc, WordStar, SuperCalc, Home Accountant Plus, Async Communications Support from IBM, Total Information Management, General Accounting, Mail Merge, Easy Writer 2, Zark 1, Microsoft Decathlon, DBase 2, Basic Compiler, Visitrend, Visiplot, and, and on. Uh, what I'm reading from is a soft talk list of the top 30 programs uh, that's published monthly based on sales. Uh, what is important software? Well, one definition is it's software that people buy. So one way we try to make sure we run all the important software is by uh, making sure that it runs the uh, uh, current top 30. Uh, to an individual user, important software is the software you need to solve your problem right now. And maybe in an even, at least an equally important sense, in a looking forward sense, it's the ability to run new generations of personal productivity software, like TK Solver from Software Arts and 123 from Lotus. But beware, not all claims of IBM compatibility are this straightforward. And I'll go into that in more detail in a few minutes. Next slide, please. The third requirement is software comp compatibility and in this sense, I mean with other personal computers that already exist in companies. This is a different aspect from that already, uh, from that I just discussed. But it's a very important factor to the many companies, most companies today, that are already using personal computers. For these companies, in particular the ones using IBM PCs, a compact portable computer will fit right in without causing really any significant perturbation. I believe this factor will become increasingly important as companies become more aware of the problems created when two coworkers are using incompatible personal computers. Next slide, please. The fourth requirement is expandability. As important as the first three requirements are, the ability to take advantage of new storage and communications capabilities must be present or the product will become obsolete for the, before the customer has learned how to use it. The compact portable computer has three available expansion slots in its standard configuration, which is two more than the equivalent function IBM PC. This means that a compact user can add a Winchester disk and a communications option, such as a Direct Connect modem or an Ethernet interface, and still have one slot available for an important future option. As with software, option boards which plug into the IBM personal computer will plug into a compact portable. The large base of third-party option boards available for the IBM PC is also available for the Compaq. And new boards are appearing every week from independent add-on hardware manufacturers. This continual adaptation of new technology to the Compaq computer will extend its life and keep it from becoming obsolete for a long, long time. Next slide. Well, that's the Compaq portable personal computer. How is it unique? It is the only product on the market that satisfies all the requirements that I mentioned. It's clearly not just an IBM look-alike since its portability makes it suitable for applications where the IBM PC is really not suitable at all. And it's more compatible with the IBM PC software base than any other personal computer except for the IBM PC, of course. The fact of its uniqueness has caused the compact portable computer to be accepted into the mainstream of the retail computer store channel. 
where it stands alone as a full function, portable, personal computer with excellent software availability and expandability. Okay, we can turn the projector off now and I guess bring the lights up. I'd like to tell you now briefly who Compact Computer Corporation is. We're a venture capital finance startup from Houston, Texas. We formed the company uh, in mid-February. There were three original founders. Uh, all three of us were out of Texas Instruments in Houston. Since then, we've raised over 10 million in venture capital financing. Uh, it's been a, a very exciting year, but it's also been a very uh, fast-moving year. To give you a little idea, we started actually started the first pencil on paper design the 1st of March. We completed our first prototype in three months, the day the NCC started in Houston. Uh, we actually started production in early October, which was seven months after the beginning of the design. We announced on November 4th in New York, eight months after starting the design, and we will begin production shipments in January, just about 10 months after starting the design and two months after announcement. One of our most important characteristics uh, when you're looking at new startups in the marketplace is that we do have a very solid base of top-notch venture capital, uh, not the least of which is uh, the uh, partnership that Mitch and I have in common, which is uh, Seven Rosen Partners. Ben Rosen, well-known in the industry, uh, been very uh, valuable uh, as a board member and advisor. LJ7, very different from Ben, but also very experienced in uh, startups. He started MossTech and uh, grew it to be a several hundred million dollar semiconductor company. Uh, in terms of distribution, we've already announced Sears Business System Centers. We announced them as our initial uh, phase of distribution uh, at Comdex. Uh, we will also be in other major independent stores and in major computer lands, including uh, computer land of Boston. And we're very excited about that. We feel like we're in the mainstream of the uh, uh, most important channel of distribution for personal computers. Okay, now I'd like to, uh, to make a few comments on the personal computer market itself. Uh, first point I guess I'd like to make, I've alluded to it by some of the uh, comments I've made, but I believe very strongly that IBM has set a, an architecture standard for second generation personal computers. The process really began shortly after the PC was announced, and in some cases shortly before, when all major independent software companies began adapting their products to run on the PC and also began planning their next generation products to take advantage of the important new features that it offered. And although it took nearly a year to accomplish, more important business and productivity software now exists for the IBM PC and for any other personal computer. It's true that in terms of just numbers of programs that more exist for the Apple II and on CPM80, but most of these are not important to business and professional users of personal computers. And those that are important, and there are some, are already available for the IBM PC. And again, more important than all of these is probably the new generation of, of software packages, which are starting to show up. Again, TK Solver, one, two, three. Very important point. The product they are developed to run on first is the IBM PC. And most will never be available for the Apple II or for CPM80 machines. There's a lot of different reasons, but the, I believe the primary reason is because of the speed and memory limitations of these older 8-bit machines. When you consider this fact, it leads me to conclude that 8-bit personal computers are now obsolete for business and professional users. And it's based on one premise, and that is that the important new software packages, they're going to open up really the marketplace even, even greater than it has been to business and professional users are just not going to be available. And in the cases where they are available, they will be available very late compared to the 
to the uh, standard machines in the industry. Another important measure of a standard is its installed base. Most observers estimate that over 200,000 IBM personal computers have already been shipped, and the shipping rate must be well over 20,000 per month. With DEC just starting to ship their PC, it's hard to imagine them or really any other manufacturer of second generation personal computers catching or even coming close to IBM for a very long time. And what this situation means is that there will continue to be a strong incentive for software companies to develop their business and productivity packages for the IBM PC first. Now, a large number of software companies developing software for the IBM PC, the large number of software packages already available for it, and the very large install base of units have worked together to create an important phenomenon. The standard that IBM established is now independent of IBM. The fears of IBM destroying compatibility by changing a bit somewhere in the PC are totally unfounded. In the first place, it would greatly hurt IBM's business if all the software packages out there suddenly didn't run on their PC. And second, if they did, an unbelievable demand would be created for compatible products because of the inertia of the large install base and the many existing software packages. I believe the industry owes a lot to IBM for coming in and setting a standard and there was really a lot of chaos, but the standard now belongs to the industry. And I believe we're now witnessing an important new trend in the personal computer industry. The many PC vendors that tout their product as being compatible with the IBM PC are ushering in a period where manufacturers will strive for true compatibility with the industry standard architecture. And the benefits will be great for just about everybody involved, for hardware manufacturers, software companies, dealers, as well as the end user. At the present time, however, a compact portable computer is the only personal computer on the market which is truly compatible with the IBM PC. Many companies have started the race to achieve this level of compatibility, but to the degree that I've been able to, to check it, Compaq is the only one to cross the finish line, at least so far. So now I'd like to point out some of the examples of situations where a product is claimed to be compatible with the IBM personal computer, but in fact, the level of compatibility is inadequate to achieve the, the important benefits that I've been covering. The most common grounds for claiming compatibility with the IBM PC is running MS-DOS. What this level of compatibility gets you is WordStar and SuperCalc, important programs. Unless a truly compatible basic interpreter is provided, in addition to MS-DOS, which is really one of the most difficult aspects of compatibility, many accounting packages won't run, and, and other important packages, such as VisiFile, won't run. Uh, if, if in that environment, also, any in-house developed application programs probably won't run because if you develop on an IBM PC uh, in BASIC, which is uh, for the typical businessman the most likely target language, uh, there's going to be an incompatibility. And programs which definitely won't run are VisiCalc, uh, 1, 2, 3, at least without modification, and many important graphics programs <coughs> such as VisiPlot. Another common source of incompatibility really is in the graphics area itself. The manufacturer may have, in fact, gone to the trouble to make his product compatible enough to run text-oriented programs such as VisiCalc. But typically, he decides to improve on IBM's graphics in some way, uh, such as offering higher resolution. This turns out to be a poor trade-off, since graphics will be a very important part of the new integrated software packages, such as 1, 2, 3, and MBA. And really not to mention uh, some of uh, what I consider the most important programs like Microsoft's Flight Simulator and Decathlon. Uh, if the graphics isn't compatible, they won't run. Okay, uh, another area. It almost goes without saying that if a, a product's disk drives are different from those of the IBM PC, it won't be able to run IBM PC software off the shelf. 
even if everything else in the unit were truly compatible with the standard architecture, there's just no way to get a copy protected program from the IBM diskette to the incompatible media if you're a user. Now I'd like to comment on an approach for, for creating software availability that is presently being used fairly widely by both American and Japanese vendors. This is the dual processor architecture that combines a Z80, typically, with a 16-bit processor such as an 8088. The theory is that by running CPM80 on the Z80, you solve the short-term software availability problem. And access to new 16-bit software, when it is available, is provided by CPM86. There are several problems with this theory. Most of the perceived thousands of available CPM programs will not run because of a different disk format. The most important near-term software, which I again contend is the new integrated packages, will not run due to one or more of the reasons I've mentioned previously. And as for a future software, unless the 16-bit part of the architecture is truly compatible with the standard architecture of the IBM PC, the important packages either will not be available ever or will become available later than they will for other products which are truly compatible with this standard. And by the way, where the dual processor approach is important, and it will be important in certain specific areas and applications, it's certainly possible with the IBM PC and the Compaq by adding uh, the add-in Z80 boards that are available, such as Baby Blue and several others that are available now. Now I'd like to tackle one more area, and that's 32-bit architectures. I've stated just shortly ago that 8-bit machines are now obsolete. In, in this market that I've been addressing. A very interesting question is, will 32-bit machines obsolete the 16-bit architecture? And I have to answer probably someday. But I don't think this event is imminent. Because of the large installed base of personal computers that are compatible with a standard architecture, there is a tremendous incentive for a software company to continue to develop applications to run on that architecture. Now, when software technology evolves to the point where the speed or memory size of, of the standard architecture is inadequate and the advantages of the new software are truly compelling, then the door will be open for establishing a new standard for 32-bit architectures. The door will be opened. But unless someone with the impact of an IBM comes in and quickly establishes a standard, the shift to that architecture will come very slowly. Okay, that, that completes uh, my prepared remarks. I'd now like to open the floor to, uh, to questions. Yes? Uh, from the Convex show, we learned two things about the Compact. One, it could not boot the IBM PC DOS disks. And second, the basic is not, basic off the shelf programs are not yet compatible. What time frame is there for resolving? Will that be for first, before first customer ship? Okay, there's two pieces of that. First part of it was uh, he couldn't boot IBM DOS? He couldn't boot PC DOS. PC DOS, okay. Uh, Is that being worked? I've done that several hundred times so far, and uh, I don't know exactly the situation you were in. Uh, where did you do that at, at Comdex? This is Comdex. At the Comdex. Uh, at the, at the sw a booth? Or? At the, well, this is at the, yeah, the suite. Okay. Uh, the specific case there, I don't know. There certainly are still some areas where an application program won't run. PC DOS will boot. Uh, in fact, uh, PC DOS and uh, Compact DOS are interchangeable between the two machines. Uh, where you get into trouble is when you go down <coughs> past the uh, the RAM vectors and go jumping off into the ROM somewhere. And, in, and a lot of those we've taken care of, but not all of them yet. Um, second part of the question is, what about BASIC? BASIC is not compatible yet. Uh, BASIC is almost compatible. Uh, it's one of those almost, uh, well, never mind. Uh, we actually do run uh, almost all the basic programs. It was a long time in coming, and we've worked very closely with Microsoft uh, to get the tokens that are passed between uh, the uh, condensed object and the interpreter to be compatible. Uh, what it evolved was in Microsoft, they had diverged, and through our prodding, uh, they've uh, begun to converge. Uh, 
do you have any specific programs in mind that, that you're thinking of? Well, off, off the shelf, the Apple IBM connection, for one, database manager from Alpha Software also did not rush. And they your basic programs? They were in basic. Okay. Um, every case of those, we're taking them and we're, we're what we're, going, we're doing is we're going and looking for, typically what happens is you've jumped into a, 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 a direct ROM location. Um, and those are tough to track down, but we're doing it. Um, and again, the mechanism, which is very laborious and uh, uh, time consuming, but one we're committed to is to find each of the programs as they come available and track down where it is and uh, in that way put what, uh, what was supposed to be there uh, in the IBM case there in the compact. Uh, we will be, uh, I believe we will, be, we will run the entire top 30 uh, some soft talk, as well as many others, but in particular, th by that measure of importance, uh, when we begin shipping in January. Uh, beyond that, I guess, as those of you who have uh, talked to our software department, uh, they're very eager to find out any problems you're having and, uh, and try to, to dig to the bottom of it. Yes? Uh, when you have, when you do find those problems, are they uh, upgradable because uh, how easily can you retrofit these machines and it might go up January 1 or whatever? Well, what's the fix it? Normally, where the problem exists is in the BIOS ROM. Um, and that is a pluggable ROM and it can be upgraded. Uh, our, our desire is to make the compatibility level so high from the beginning that there will be a, a fairly long period of time that we can. Uh, uh, absorb various changes and come out with another new stable ROM, which hopefully gets us to a very high percentage. Uh, but there's no specific policy in that area. Um, we certainly are committed to making all the important packages run. Exactly how we'll do that and the kind of problems we're going to run into is not clear yet. One thing that is clear is we've, we've gained a uh, really uh, through a lot of tough uh, effort a pretty good insight into the problems of compatibility. And unless a company is doing that same level of effort and committed to that, uh, they're going to fall considerably short of true compatibility. Thank you. The second thing, what about the science and engineering firms? Raytheon and Sudbury bought a hundred plus IBM PCs. We have a, a separate class of software that we all like the business software. I'm busy kept very useful, but how about Fortran and Pascal P01 compilers? How are they going to run? Uh, those all run. Already, yeah. They just work at the operating system. That's right. They typically, uh, really, for that kind of program where you go through the interrupt vectors, uh, uh, there's not a problem. The problem normally occurs when you've jumped down into a hard address into into the wrong. 8087 support. You have an 8087. There's an 8087 socket, but there's no software available right now to run it. Uh, same software that you did with the PC then. That has, yeah, that software has been tried out. We've had compacts in a lot of different software companies, and I know in at least one case they have run their software that was uh, targeted for the 8087 with an 8087 in it, and it, and it worked. Uh, again, those are very cursory levels of checkout. It worked. It's a good start. Um, uh, we've got to, uh, on a priority basis, go through and really check those out very thoroughly. Yes. I'm listening to that same question. Essentially, he's describing important applications which aren't important by your marketing measure. And we similarly have a broad software base that's looking for a smaller market that needs higher performance than can be delivered through MS-DOS. Uh, to what degree, if it doesn't meet your perception for importance, can our customers find that we get the right support from you so we can, for instance, find the necessary DOS locations, the necessary ROM locations, to do the development work that you find not appropriate for you to do. Will you be supporting software houses rather than letting them be supported by you? Giving them the necessary different locations so they can make modifications. Well, what I, you know, I focus my remarks on a specific market segment. The reason is there's a great danger anytime you speak too broadly, and, sure. and I, I'm trying to define it as uh, at least the major single segment. That's not to say that those other segments aren't important. Uh, we certainly intend to work with software companies 
typically that's not a very big problem when you're dealing with two companies who understand what they're doing. Uh, questions can be solved very quickly. And, and I anticipate that to be typical in the situation you're talking about. Well, for example, IBM surprised us in the large level of ROM information that they made available early on, uh, locations that were of importance. They were published, they were in a relatively inexpensive manual, and it was available very early in the, in the curve. That helped a lot of companies do good work, uh, companies that didn't want to just rely on staying in guts. Will you be supplying similar listings to seriously interested groups? Uh, we don't intend to at this time, and the reason is what, it, what that does is encourage uh, more incompatibility. Uh, the interrupt, the vectors that point into the ROM uh, will be the same. And so if you go through that path, it'll work on the IBM and it'll work on us and other compatible machines. Uh, you're in danger, by the way, of when an IBM updates their ROM of not running. Let's, let's do that just one step more slowly, if you will. Are you saying that the vectors in DOS should be used? Yes, the, the RAM vectors that are a step into the ROM, because those can be changed when the ROM changes. But some of those apparently differ between you and IBM, otherwise your basic would be running. Uh, no, the basic. the basic problems have to do more with the basic ROMs. Our, ROM, our basic is RAM-based, and of course IBM's is ROM-based, and uh, uh, believe it or not, some programs actually jump off into basic ROM. That's very dangerous. Uh, that's going to work for a while, but the, the product's going to evolve. And uh, I know from dealing with Microsoft, they didn't like BASIC and ROM to start with. BASIC has to evolve, and uh, I think there are going to be some incompatibilities generated when IBM updates it. They may not ever. You know, who knows? But uh, it's, it's a dangerous situation for anybody to, to do that. So you will have the vector's location addresses available to... Well, they're the same as the IBM. Use the IBM Technical Reference Manual. And that's a general reliable statement? Yes. Can... Yes. Thank you. And again, if there's any difference there, those are the easy ones to fix. I would be very surprised if there were any differences there. Mm -hmm. That's good news. We'd like to try it out later. Okay. Yes. Any possibility that we could get a different keyboard? <laughs> uh, it's certainly a possibility, and there's several mechanisms for that. Uh, the keyboard we use is built by a, uh, uh, a keyboard manufacturer who also sells a, an add-on keyboard for the IBM. It's certainly possible that through computer stores, a, a keyboard vendor could offer a fixed keyboard that that computer store could uh, install for you. It's, it's not that hard to install. What we're going to do in the future, uh, I don't anticipate a different keyboard. It's very tempting. Uh, it bugs me like it bugs you, and yet, uh, We've done a lot of thinking, an awful lot of thinking about the compatibility issue, and now that there is a standard, we're going to do everything we can to help uh, reinforce the standard and not uh, diverge from it. Sorry. <laughs> okay, a couple more questions. I, I've been over here. Is there any... How many programs have you found that run on the Um, well, the question is how many, how many programs have we found? Uh, we found a lot along the way, almost all of which we fixed. And the normal fix is to, uh, to move a routine to a specific location in ROM where it, somebody hadn't used the vector. Every now and then it's something we've missed in terms of a vector that was important and we didn't understand it. Uh, uh, I can't tell you a program that I know of right now that doesn't run because the ones that, that we've been able to get, and we're focusing again on the, on the top 30 and, and programs like that, have been fixed or, or at least the fix has been identified and is going into the next uh, revision of the ROM. Also, have you had any legal static from uh, No, we haven't. Uh, we were very careful from the very beginning. Uh, that was, I guess, uh, Franklin and Apple were going at it about that time, and uh, we realized that there were some very big legal pitfalls. So we had good legal advice from the beginning. We feel like we've, we've, we've developed it ourselves. We've not copied anything. 
Uh, what IBM does is only they can tell you, but uh, we, we don't anticipate any problem. Yes? two parts. First, how many slots? There's a total of five slots designed in the machine, the same as IBM. But by using uh, uh, later technology memory, you get up to 256 k bytes on the uh, system board. By combining the uh, printer port with the uh, uh, floppy controller, uh, we've got three slots available for future options. Uh, second question is, yes, again, we've there's a parallel effort, just like for the software, of trying out uh, add-in boards. And uh, there's actually been less problem with the hardware than, than some of the software, because it's typically better defined by the technical reference manual. And uh, I believe that at Comdex, uh, we did try some, uh, some boards, uh, both uh, SDLC and uh, BiSync boards. And I, as I understand it, they work. And if they didn't work, then they, they certainly will work. The, the problems were identified, if there were any. Uh, one last question. Okay. What are the major differences between your machine and the Hyperion machine? Um, that changes with time. <laughs> uh, back when they announced uh, at Comdex in the summer, and I think they were about at the same stage we were in development, they showed a prototype at that show. Uh, they did not run. Uh, <coughs> any of the graphics software, and I don't think they even ran the text software like VisiCalc. They thought they were compatible and found out that VisiCalc and, and some fairly important programs didn't run. Uh, at, at the more, most recent Comdex, uh, I believe they had fixed part of it, and as I understand it, they did run text kinds of things like uh, uh, VisiCalc, but they still were not graphics compatible. Um, they had improved on the graphics. I think they had gone to, instead of 200 lines, 250 lines. A little better graphics gives up a lot in software availability. OK, I, I think we're out of time. I will be happy to answer any questions you have. I'll stay as late as anybody wants to talk. And uh, that's my favorite subject. So uh, uh, thank you for letting me come. I've enjoyed it very much. Keyboard's dead. That's OK. Okay. <laughs> that was just some interesting stuff. So we, we're back to this one. Oh, the keyboard is really dead. Oh, power down. <coughs> okay. So here with Miller, I think. Uh, sort of. I wrote the routines that just bombed this one. <laughs> so, are you calling the um, uh, slowness of the key doing was um, intercepting the keyboard vector and then jumping into the keyboard ROM? But this all works very nicely. It's good. Yeah, just as, just as slow as ever. <laughs> on the keyboard, fills up the buffer. Okay. This is just stuff on the system disk. Let's try the let's try fourth ride. Good word process. And then after the other. You bet. Let's see what works here. How about some of your graphics stuff? Um, yeah. Non system. Oh. <laughs> no wonder. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the one that I thought wouldn't work didn't. The one that I thought should work did. 
You mean you brought your own discs to try? Absolutely. I should have done the same. What do you have in it? I have a very nice word processor called Forthright, uh, which looks like it runs just fine. Very star. The PC, uh, uh, the PC at home. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. How are you finding the screen? I like it. It's the same as, as one, the one I'm used to working with. A little small. A little bit smaller, but boy, it even chops off at about the same place here. Actually, it chops off a bit lower. So there's a little bit of... Yes, it's just the same color as mine, the one I'm used to. Looks, uh, let's see... Would you get IBM Monochrome? Yes. I wouldn't work with a color board because no, I impossible. couldn't stand sitting there. Looks very good. Um, forget. Okay. Yeah. Uh, FW star. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> looks very compatible at that level. That's nice. Just ahead. I've got it. Somebody has music. Uh, I have some graphics here. Let's see now. I'm going to have to. I'll do graphics. Well. I'm going to have to do a little bit of trickery here. Single or double sided graphics. These are all uh, singles, but I can check out whether or not it'll run the other side also. We're going to have to boot this disk because this one won't boot. You know that already. But then we can run it. Let's see. Um, 20 load. Okay. Graph. Character set looks better than the uh, graphics board on the end. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. It's the, uh, this is the, now this is taking a while. This is actually compiling from source code, so this is going to take a while to compile. Do you think they use two different resolutions in there? Uh, they must have. I don't well, know how. graphics, it's got to be uh, quite a bit less than the mono board. Yeah. So I don't know how they accomplish that. But we'll see what happens. So far, so good. ST, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's try. Actually, let's do this. T, whoops. Um, I'm doing this in blind, okay. 500. This one, this particular one is set up to run on both monitors simultaneously and it won't do that. Yeah. That would be a little difficult. But here we go. Graphics runs just fine. Yes. And our graphics runs just fine. Our fourth right runs just fine. Uh, with our improved keyboard driver it doesn't run but that's not surprising. I didn't expect that one to run. But everything else seems to run just fine. <laughs> so. Um, it's exactly the same as on my graphics monitor, which is over next to you. Uh, and then, can you throw up the characters while you're on the graphics one? Um, Same, but it might right. Not be. But anyway, they would, they would presumably be different from what we saw earlier. I just want to see how you put it in the next time you're in um, I 
graphics monitor next to it. I put all my characters on the monitor monitor and put all my graphics over on my graphics monitor, so I don't <laughs> I don't know immediately how to do that. So actually I could yes I can do that. Let's see. Perfect. Uh, Oh, I missed him. We believe very strongly that that's the very strongly that I'll show you the instructions for Travel Six. It's only a demo, it doesn't do anything like that. If you hit a A, B, or C, it'll give you a different object in there. There's only one image. So oh, processing the image in multiple screens. And the B all the color the color set up on it. So I could hit a B for instance. And it'll load a different image in. Oh, well I must load another this is the actual generating time. And then it was just accessing upper memory. It's much nice in color. Yeah, this is quite pretty. Actually, there will be more differentiation. Uh, we've gone back and looked. Initial mapping was more or less arbitrary. We went back and looked at the common colors that were used together and have gotten more contrast. So you can see different shades of green right now. You know, and very few shades of green. Oh, no, no, it's just running slower and the missing memory takes one. No problem. Okay. It's strictly a amount of memory. How much banging around does that take? Well, really, I'm not sure. It takes a lot more than I originally thought it would. The guys have designed two piece packages. The metal inner chest and a very tough outer plastic shell that makes it very really tough. So it's not probably what I'm going to say. Yes. I, no. It's like a different. And my proposal to Tom was to run that a little bit different.